discuss this but i think it's my turn to do introductions so i'm gonna leave so um this is binary jazz a podcast about nothing in particular uh we are and on also episode... everything and and yeah <laughs> and many of those problems we're on episode 1001 is that right uh 1000 binarily speaking i don't remember where we were last week yes no, did we did correct. whatever whatever episode launched last week did we record that yeah whatever we are um I'm here with my uh, fabulous co-host, Allison, who is um, Airbnb reviewer and um, steerage class airline rider, um, and Chris, um, soccer lawn maintenance technician. You know, um, funny thing about about that, uh, <laughs> so, so Real Salt Lake is the local so- soccer team in Salt Lake, obviously. And so there is, there's a supporter section that's, um, that we used to sit in. Um, we canceled our season tickets last year, but we're actually going to be sitting there for the, the women's team this year. Anyway, so right where the supporter section is, is basically right where the lawn guy, uh, the lawn technician, generally, like, because it's where they put the, one of the um, practice goals before the game so then at the you know after before the game he pushes it off the field and so whenever he walks by there's they actually customized they actually wrote a a chant just for him to <laughs> that's it's that's like, so great i know isn't it like so whenever they see him they, they do his chant and he's like hi guys and 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 for a long time um uh there was like a water wise like don't overwater your lawn advertisement that would go while they were watering the field and so when they would do that and they see him in the commercial then they would like you know cheer. it was it's pretty cool it's really cool so, like because he's some random like dude that takes care of the grass you know yeah <laughs> and to have so that's him a be very celebrated. yeah it's a very um i guess like it, there's a lot that goes into that position i follow the on twitter i follow the guy that does the I would call it a lawn. It's not a lawn. It is turf. The turf technician for the um, mm-hmm. uh, for Everbank Field here in Jacksonville, um, and and I mean like to watch who he follows and the fields that he remarks on. Like this is this is what he does, I and mean, he has input and thoughts on all sorts of turf I, around the world. And it, it's this whole thing I didn't know existed. I've read about like they use two different types of grass um, in in the turf, um, and I think I think that that's because it has like sort of um, horizontal striping um and i think that that's what creates that effect um but yeah there's a lot that goes into it that and then like you have to keep it a certain length and you know all that stuff and there's that. a lot of adjusting seasonality right yeah yeah zamboni guy where <laughs> this, this um, recognition of caretaking for the environment that no one's acknowledging <laughs> So, so real quick, if you're just joining us, this is your first episode. Um, this is pretty much how the episodes go. The only difference is Allison usually brings a topic as opposed to us, to us stumbling across one during introductions. Otherwise, that's <laughs> exactly like a pocket version of a normal episode for us. Turf is a big deal, though. Well, I know for soccer it is because, like, there's a whole debate about fake turf versus real grass and yeah. and, and all that. So it's like it's, it is a it's, massive it's, topic. It's the, yeah. I could, I could talk about turf for a while. <laughs> I, yeah yeah although i feel like we would be hijacking the, the episode i'd be about, yes. wouldn't be opposed to it um <laughs> man the internet is cool the stuff you learn <laughs> on the internet it's not are all garbage you, are you pro pro real grass yeah yes. definitely absolutely yeah. definitely because the thing with the thing with uh artificial turf is is it's the the stuff underneath it is pretty much usually cement. I mean, you can put layers of padding or whatever, but I th- you know, somewhere underneath whatever padding you put onto it is like cement, it's concrete, whatever, you know, and you fall on that and it, it hurts. Whereas if whatever's under the grass is still like, you know, loam and soil and whatever, what, whatever you need to make grass grow, which is, and the grass itself is springier <laughs> and like the roots and yeah. This is You're so much more eloquent than I am. <laughs> <laughs> 
Stanley, the turf expert from. <laughs> bing, bing, bing. I, I, I would have, I would have totally phrased that. Like there's concrete underneath like fake turf and then the real turf. Who knows what's under there, right? But it's probably softer than concrete is where I would have left. <laughs> you use the word loam. Like I haven't used the word loam. <laughs> I mean, I probably used it once, like twice or twice just in now. my life, just now. Yeah. Otherwise, like I probably read it in a book in school <laughs> and couldn't hold my finger on it to Google it back in those days. But I had to look it up and wonder what it was. But I've, I've never used it in polite conversation like this. To be fair, I might not I be using the it. word correctly. Well, I would love if that had been my topic for this week. Loam. Oh, man, it would have blown my mind if you were like, and our topic actually is turf, so... Actually, good segue, because oh. this week we're talking about loam. <laughs> I don't even know. Is there a plural of loam? That is the topic. No. Discuss. <laughs> this is the highlight of my Thursdays, just for what it's worth. So you all know this. Like, I... I I always like Thursdays, I always roll in and it's like that part of the week where you sort of like have that, that feeling like, have I done enough? Have I accomplished enough for the week? And I kind of think like before the podcast starts, like, I, do I have time to give up this, this 45 minutes or whatever it is, right? And the answer is I don't have time to not do, wait, that doesn't make, I, I, I have to do it. It's so important. It's vital that I do it because the rest of my Thursday is so much better as a result of it, despite the amount of time I spend on Wikipedia. <laughs> well, I'm gonna take that compliment. Take it yeah, back. totally. I mean, I mean it 100 percent as a compliment. So yeah. we're we're far enough in. We should probably t- like figure out what the topic is today. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's not loam. Sorry, no. not loam. <laughs> but I am gonna Google a lot about that later. <laughs> <laughs> totally. <laughs> I'm a little a little niche expert. Uh, the topic this week is something called kintsugi. K i n t s u g i. Wait, what? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Hello. <laughs> 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 um, Kintsugi. K-I-N-T-S-U-G-I. K-I-N-T-S-U-G-I. It's a Japanese word. Uh, yeah, I figured that out. Kintsugi. <laughs> <laughs> well. Pin drops. <laughs> what, do we know about, what do we know about Japan? Uh, Japan is really weird. I could go on for quite a bit about how weird Japan is and all of my knowledge of Japan comes predominantly from uh, Asian soap operas and anime. But okay. if I'm using that as a microcosm for the entire society, like this is what their pop culture is like. And this is, and, and also like pictures, obviously. And if, but, I, but if I'm using that as like, a, as, as like, you know, this is what their pop culture and society is like, this is their form of entertainment. Japan is really weird. <laughs> What's the Japanese thing, like constant improvement, the process thing? Big and automotive. Oh, um, oh, 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 oh. Um, See, yes. you know that too about Japan. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. It sounds it's a, similar to it's a, consume it's a, or whatever this topic is. Yeah, about. it's a form of like, um, or it's been adapted into like agile development practices. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, so I think uh, this Kanban. word. Kanban. Yeah. So I think this word is related to Kanban. I don't. Okay. <laughs> and I think that because... Have both of you visited Japan? I'm just curious. No. Or Asia? No. No. I've been, yeah, I've been around Asia, but not Japan. Japan is on my list. I think it would be fantastic. Japan's on my list as well. It's been on my list for a long time. road trip, everybody. <laughs> I'm down. I'm down. This we we live, nearly... A live podcast in Japan. When I was doing... Um, Booking for a band, we nearly landed a gig at whatever the U.S. military base is over there. I think hmm. it's Navy, but I'm not sure. Um, and that would have been like a I would have no I would have had no reason to go, but you're darn <laughs> right I would have been there, you know, schlepping boxes or something. And when you say um, booking, booking for a band, is that sorry? Is this a a past a past thing that? Yeah, you it's need? not a euphemism. It's a thing I did. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, but like as a, as a job. I'm not sure that euphemism would. Aside. Oh, I mean, I got paid for it, but I don't have to make a living. Uh-huh. Uh, I'm trying to remember what else I did around that time. And that's what you I, did. There was, there was, you, you booked gigs for a band. Like, that's what you yeah. did. Was it a band or was it bands plural? It was a singular band. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it, was, uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't like all of my income. And it was 
it was a lot of my time, more of my time than it was income percentage wise. It was fun. It was interesting. I was young enough to do silly stuff like that and, uh, and live on mac and cheese for a while. Um, yeah. Uh, say the word again. Spell it again. Kintsugi. Kintsugi. It sounds like it's sushi food related. To me. Yeah, it sounds yeah, like it's food sushi. related for sure. <laughs> I had um, so my Asia, Asia experiences were mostly sourcing products um, when I worked uh, a couple jobs ago. Um, it was like e-commerce something or other, BPB commerce, and um, we brought in all sorts of crazy stuff from Asia, um, mostly um, like the Pearl River Delta um, in China and a bit from Taiwan. So in Taiwan, um, at a factory, we spent the day with like. Oh, anytime you went to a factory, like it was as much about the product as it was about like the relationship building and, you know, you always drank a ton of tea and then had to go eat um, in the factory and we feed you. So we went to a Japanese restaurant and, um, uh, you know, I don't speak a lick of, um, boy, I wonder if they speak there. Uh, probably Cantonese. I don't know. I'm not sure what Taiwan's native tongue is. Let's just assume it's Cantonese. Probably not. Um, uh, so we went to this Japanese place. Water for more food. Googling later. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, well, I mean, the thing is, like, dialects of Chinese all sound pretty much the same to my ear. So, but you can't say they spoke Chinese because there was not a Chinese language. Right. There are thousands of them. I digress. Surprise. Um, so we went to this Japanese restaurant and the food was, was fine, except for this one dish, the grossest dish I've had in Asia. It was this, like, shot glass and it was this green, it looked like pudding, jello y stuff. Um, but it was warm and salty, and I can usually eat anything. I took like three bites of this, and I'm like, man, I just can't. It would be rude to not eat it, you know? And I, I just couldn't eat that thing. I ate some stuff, man, but that was one where I just drew the line. Not sure what it was. The rule of there's thumb was never a, ask. Okay, so there's a, there's a, uh, a Netflix original series that I discovered recently. So my Netflix recommendations is really jacked up now um, because we went through a, a stint of watching lots and lots and lots of Korean soap operas. Um, <laughs> as one so, does. <laughs> as one does. Dude, Korean soap operas are amazing. I highly recommend. Um, anyway, so, so, uh, so we got this, I got this recommendation for a Japanese show that is about a guy who is i don't know like a sales guy but he's like the he's like committed to being like the best sales guy in the world ever but the only reason why he is committing himself to being the best sales guy in the world ever is so he can use his spare time to go eat the most amazing foods around. And then when he eats the food, he goes into this like weird hallucinogenic, like <laughs> acid trip of euphoric orgasm whenever he is like eating this whatever it is the food and i'm pretty sure that that weird green jello in a shot glass thing is a thing that he ate yeah so i i, I it's it's um I, I think it's also based around the premise that he's a super taster um so Ooh. yeah so like it, it's like <sighs> super sweet tooth man there's like it's his name and then super sweet tooth man or something i don't i don't remember what the title is but it's it's pretty it's it's eye-opening yeah to that end if i was at a restaurant and someone like presented this dish again i would totally try it again in a different context i might not do more than two spoonfuls of it but I'd totally try it there's again. like a five minute interlude where he's like trying to choose between two different sweet uh dessert dishes and uh decide between the white sauce and the brown sauce and he goes on debating the 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 properties of each sauce uh, in great detail and eventually decides that he's going to have the brown sauce, but then after he has the one of the brown sauce, he orders the one with the white sauce too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I really love dining opportunities when, um, like multi-course where you, it's, it's like a surprise. Um, and, and that there's like a lot of like presentation from the wait staff in regards to it. Right. Like, here is a whatever. Well, I mean, not presentation like flash, but like explanation of what this dish is and why, and um, you know, like the thought process that went into it. 
the artsy fartsy side of like when they have a narrative of like the story of how it's like it was charbroiled to a fine and then sauteed slightly we sprinkled time ever so (laughs) like and then they tell and then they set it down and you're like oh i um (laughs) <laughs> I do find, I mean, I, w- I do think I, that I appreciate, like, a story about the food more than just, like, here's your food. Yeah. Here's your menu. <laughs> I went to, <laughs> oh, I have to Google this restaurant. Hold on. Um, uh, but that's always, like, the fun part about kill. sometimes when people, like, when restaurants do specials is because the specials have almost, they often have a better description than the menu descriptions for what it would be if they listed it normally. So there's this molecular gastronomy restaurant mm-hmm. in Chicago called Alinea. And the chef, Grant Atchitz, Atch- I don't know how to say his name, something like that. Um, a couple years ago, no, yeah, two years ago, um, they were redoing the restaurant in the interior. So he took the entire restaurant staff on tour and they did a month in Paris and a month in Miami. And I was in Miami for a conference. Uh, I was going to be in Miami for a conference while I was down there. So my brother and I, brother-in-law and I, um, do this restaurant website. So we decided like this would be like a very cool thing for us to do and write about. Um, go eat at Alinea while it was in residence in Miami. Um, and I don't remember how many courses it was. I think 13 or 16. The Jeez. first course was, it was, yeah, our seating was like 10.30 p.m. Um, and it was, I mean, every single table was like an event. Our, the first course was this little... Um, cube that was uh, flavored like a Chicago style hot dog as a welcome. Um, like the dill, you could taste every part of the Chicago hot dog in it. Um, I ate a balloon that night, <laughs> like a floating inflated balloon. Um, there was there was a fire on the table when we sat down, and um, like five courses in, the waiter like plucked this food out of the fire and unwrapped <laughs> it and prepared it for us in front of us. The dessert was like just made on the table. I'm trying, I mean, like every course was kind of, it was like, it was like an alien, like saw food and then tried to create food for humans. And this was the result. I mean, it was so bizarre and it, it, I mean, it was like way over the top and way, um, eccentric, eccentric and extravagant in like, eccentric, not combining those two words. That's where I was going with. Yeah. Yeah. And, but not something like normal people would eat on a regular thing, right? Like a regular occurrence. Oh um, no, you don't normally eat inflated balloons. Uh, not as a, not out of, not out of course I have it no. So I like, and we left from there probably around 1 AM we finished and got in the car and drove like five hours straight home through the night. And I had to work the next day. Um, and I, I, I was going to sleep in the car, but every time I closed my eyes, like I couldn't not think about like this entirely different take on food and eating and the purpose of dining and um, the whole nine yards. And it really, um, one stupid meal like changed my thought process in life uh, in, in, in ways I did not expect. And that experience right there is Kintagi, Kintugi, Kintsugi? Yeah, kans- Kansume. <laughs> Kansugi, yeah. It, it might be, it may be. Um, so fanciful maybe so is, are we have we reached a part of the show where you tell us what it is and then we discuss like how I mean, far I off could, we were I from could, every guess i could list on or, one hand the the words and concepts uh in japanese that i know and it's not one of them <laughs> like otaku hentai manga i don't know it probably stops there <laughs> <laughs> one hand that kanban on lockdown yeah, kanban yeah there we go yeah yeah i do think though that like Osaka. My expo- <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I, it's either has, either has to be food related or procedure related. Those are the only two options, clearly. Is or enter- I guess entertainment. Created yet another binary for my topic to fall within. <laughs> yeah, does it fall within that? Either one of those? Um, I, well, I don't know, because I feel like procedure is like a very broad like what I don't know. I feel like that's a really <laughs> like what does that mean? Come on. <laughs> it's <a procedure. laughs> this thing um. Is, um so Kinsugi is it's the art of fixing broken pottery with oh, right. a special metallic lacquer. So there's a few different ways to fix what? the fractures or breaks. Don't pretend like you knew what that no, was. I, Come I, on. I, 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 didn't, I 
I didn't know the word. I didn't know the word. I did know of the practice of when, um, when delicate or, you know, very valuable China breaks, I shouldn't say that word, uh, pottery breaks, then they, there's an art form to putting it back together, special paint and glue and whatever, so that it can be reused. And also like the break becomes kind of decorative because they have done it and they put it back together in this way that, that sort of emphasizes the, the craftsmanship that goes into having to assemble it back together piece by piece. Mm -hmm. And the type of, wow. porcelain, the type of porcelain they use is usually so fine and so delicate that it's not the sort of thing like you drop a bowl and it cracks into like four or five pieces. It's like the type of thing that you drop on the floor and it cracks into a yes. bazillion pieces. And so reassembling it really is like ridiculously time consuming and, and labor intensive. Mm -hmm. I like so much about this topic. I like number one, that there is a single Japanese word for this, right? <laughs> because it takes us a full sentence to explain it. But <laughs> in Japan, you could say Kansugi and someone said, oh yeah. I would know exactly the context. Number two, I like um, I like that there's the celebration of like what you're saying when it's reassembled. Then it's not like it's it's not like glued together. You can't see the seams. Like it's it's evident where it was broken. Yeah. So I like the like the celebration of the like the breaking and the uh, fixing or like the flaws mm -hmm. are are part of the new creation or the fixed cre the the original thing put back together i like yeah, that I like it too. celebrates the the history of the thing as a whole by em almost emphasizing the breaks mm -hmm. that have happened mm -hmm. and then the third thing i like is that allison thinks we can talk about this for almost <laughs> an hour well okay so i for 15 minutes i'm a little bit of a of a of a ringer on the topic more so probably than you are gary just because yes just yes because, this is awesome just because, i've waited for this episode where someone actually knew something about the topic well I mean, okay so the two of us as we're not supposed to so my partner aaron uh makes pottery i mean she hasn't done it in years but she studied pottery in, in school as, as part of her art major and she we brought a wheel a kick wheel uh home uh from from redlands california into utah when we after she graduated and she used that for a while and she did pottery at uh, studios for a while and we're probably going to get her a new wheel uh, in the relatively near future. But yeah, so like I have learned through osmosis various little things about pottery and pottery making and I've tried doing stuff a couple times and made really ugly, bad, thick things um, and, um, and glazes and I've glazed things and that's fun. Um, glazing actually is really fun um and yeah so that's how i know about this thing and, and one thing that that i've sort of like i guess i've growing up i sort of had this idea that like when something is break broken like you screwed up um you know like breaking a thing is like you screwed up you're you asshole um but her approach to things was very different because it was like things break because they are used and this idea of kintsugi is um, is very much the same sort of thing, right? Like things break because they are used. If it's broken, it doesn't mean that somebody screwed up. It it got broken because you use it. It's a thing that is part of your your daily life, and so therefore, um, it shouldn't be like you asshole for breaking that bowl that I really like. It's like you know, like well, that bowl was much loved. Do you think the concept? The building on that, do you think the concept itself, um, as we become like a like a one-time use society, like do you think that concept, like the value of that, either becomes more important because there are fewer things that can actually be fixed? I think about like a lot of plastics, right? Like plastic stuff generally when breaks cannot be fixed because of the nature of plastics, um, printers and kids' toys and crap of that nature, um, and compressed wood like furniture is pretty popular, like Ikea stuff. Oh, I can't, but Ikea has some stuff good stuff, but I mean, you know, the, the genre of things I'm speaking. Um, so those sort of things that can't effectively be fixed, like, does that make Kansugi more valuable uh, for the things that can? You know, like I have a nice wooden table and 
you know, if I broke a leg on it or were to chip it, like there's still solutions to fix it. And it may not be as flawless as it once was, but it still has purpose and value and it's fine and just cosmetically is different. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think that um, I was reading a thing recently about, um, oh, it was about uh, the Apple iPhone battery thing, how the battery is on this sixes and seven just suck and they die and then apple put this stupid thing in to make your phone suck even more and how horrible that was and so as a result apple was going to um make battery replacements cheaper so 30 buck battery replacements um if your battery is sucking um and i was reading this article about it and it was saying you know like probably this wouldn't have this effect but it would be really nice if it if this sort of thing led to like people treating their phones like people once treated their computers, like a part breaks, you go into the thing and you get it fixed or you open it up and you fix it yourself. Like w- the way that phones are made, particularly iPhones, like it's the sacred thing that you can't open. Um, and that's, you know, people are, but people are holding onto their phones for longer because the, I mean, honestly, the technology is not advancing nearly as fast as it used to be. So it's pretty much just, you know, some, a new coat of paint on the old stuff that was there last year. So like the progression of things. So it's, and, and they're really freaking expensive. So why would you buy drop 600, 700, 800, a thousand dollars every year, every two years? Like you, it should be an investment that you are able to, uh, you know, improve on or, or, or re fix over time. Um, and it shouldn't be prohibitively expensive to do so. I um, I still have my iPhone six, and I'm experiencing that. Like right around a couple weeks ago, right around thirty percent, it just shut off. And when I powered mm. back on, <clears throat> it was like, hey, we um, we tried to do something that used more CPU than we possibly could with the battery you have. So we're going to put you in this throttling mode. You can disable it if you want. I don't care. My phone is like, I mean, I use it for communication generally ish. Uh, but uh, previously. Um, use my phone before I got into into dev work. My phone was like attached to my ear for six hours a day, and or I was sending email or following sales numbers or something on it. Like, I mean, I used it as much as my computer, if not more. Um, and I dropped my phone and broke it. I was either replacing or getting it repaired. And um, it's funny to have the same device for for two years now, or so I, maybe longer. I don't know. I'm not sure how long I've had this phone. I don't know. I don't really have any attachment to it. It just does what it does. And it's definitely slower than it used to be, but it's fine. I, I decided that there was a problem when like I could literally be looking at like reading an article on the phone and watch the battery drop from like, you know, 47% down to 32%, like, like watching the numbers tick down as I'm just like looking at a normal. And then I'm like, yeah, that might be an indication I should do something about this. And then I read that article and then I, and then I, I, so I got the $30 replacement and, and, it's better it's not fantastic but it's better than it was i assume you, that's um, because i have a lot of stuff open and i use it that it just drained battery but now i can like i used to have to like charge it twice a day to get it to so by the end of the day i wouldn't it wouldn't be dead and now i can pretty much go through a day um so yeah it made a difference i have several questions yes i have several answers the first one the first one both of you are um are technology folk um yes. And you repair your own, you repair, you've been in the situation where you repair your own computers and replaced parts, I assume. What's the most obscure thing you've, you've repaired on a computer? Like at what point, like you were, you were like, situation you're taking, you're going, wow, this, at this point, this makes no, um, no sense. Like I'm really putting a lot of time into this one single part. Uh, I have a, I have a external hard drive that I got several years ago. Uh, it's a Seagate something or other. Um, and I, when the, when that drive died, it was like, well, I could probably take it apart and put in a new hard drive. So I did. Uh, so that's probably the most obscure thing. I also, um, uh, obscure. So, um, I probably talked about the photo kiosks that I used to work on. Um, I have, I, uh, when I was with Albertsons, like I've, I've taken apart the photo kiosk machines and like looked inside and, and, um, I used to have an external CD-ROM drive, and I played with those. Um, yeah. I don't know. It was just for fun. I don't feel like I've done anything that obscure, because I'm, I'm also just not a huge hardware person in general, so I feel like the stuff that I've done has been generally straightforward, because if it's too obscure, 
it isn't usually up my alley as far as <laughs> me making the decision to replace the thing. I have a, my iMac has, it's sitting behind me and it has a hard drive that, that died. And I actually did pull off the screen so that I could replace the hard drive. Um, that's about as far as I got though, because like taking the thing apart, you like, you have to have like, you have to wedge things into different parts in order to like lift out the, the stuff. And then like, then you can go in and reach and all the cables are like super short. Um, so I do have plans in replacing that hard drive. I've just been postponing it a lot. I, I did the hard drive on there. A similar situation with my desktop where it'll die suddenly and for no apparent reason. Sometimes after 10 minutes, sometimes after three days of being on. There's no pattern or usage, but I think it's a power supply issue. But it's also an old enough thing that I'm like, I'm not going to pay someone else to do it. So part of me is just like, should I just try to do the wedge and the prop and the and maybe manage to fix it or maybe manage to screw it up <laughs> depending on I, my... I did i did completely screw up uh a a macbook a really old macbook whose hard drive was doing <laughs> that horrible clicking noise um so i took it apart i took the hard drive out and then i was like Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> all the guts of the macbook like all over the place and i couldn't put it back together and and I think I ended up selling it on Craigslist for 50 bucks or something. <laughs> Just come take this thing. <laughs> I, have, I, have, I have another one that was, it's an obscure for no real reason. We had the, do you remember the old MacBooks that they came in black and white? I had a black one and my partner had a white one. Something happened to my black one. So basically it rendered, rendered it useless. And in the end, we ended up kind of combining them into kind of a Franken laptop. So when you open, it's like yes. very much like, kind of like an Oreo situation. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, which was kind of pointless in the long run, but it was really fun at the time. <laughs> that was the kind of answer I was looking for. Just out of, I mean, just for what it's worth. Like I wanted like that Franken computer. I had it'd be pre, pre MacBook, the old iBooks had, um, I'm not sure what year. There was a, an, an issue with the graphics processor where it, the board would warp and enough mm. to the point where the chip would pull up and the screen would, crap out and the system would die. Um, I figured out that if you put pressure on top of the chip, you could hold it in place. So I disassembled the iBook and like used like rubber feet as shims and reassembled it and kind of like created like a clamp on the corner of the iBook and got like another year out of the silly thing. Um, it was no longer portable at that point because it was clamped to the corner of my desk. Um, but it, it didn't shut down after that. Yeah. I also ran, I, at that point I also ran a, um, a server under the desk that had two power supplies because it had, it had eight hard drives. So one was an old AT power supply that had like an external power switch as opposed to like the ATX that you wire up to the chassis. So I, I would fire up like four hard drives first. Um, so you hear a little machine like whirring and then I'd fire up like the drive that was the boot drive. So those four drives were already powered up before the rest of the machine powered up. That was my weird, some of my weird stuff. I, I've, I've killed a lot of computers now. Um, it's panic time, obviously. So <laughs> I love that this is the part of the program where has um, been dubbed panic time. <laughs> yeah, the part of the show where we 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 see the uh, countdown timer in our video recording session, um, and I get nervous, and Allison presents questions. Um, typically so three. oh yeah, we did we did figure out what the topic was. Okay. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure that we actually covered that at some point, and, and, but we did, so that's good. So my first question is, can you name the seven dwarves? The classic seven dwarves. I know folklore-wise, it's all over the place, but the Disney version. Uh, dopey, grumpy. Happy, grumpy, sleepy, dopey, sneezy, uh, Susie, and Frankie. Um, no. <laughs> it's close. I'm not uh, sure lose count me. after a while. I think that's the problem. Happy, dopey, grumpy, sleepy, mm. what now? Mm. Angry. Grumpy. <laughs> Angry. <laughs> Angry, grumpy. <laughs> yeah, I can't. The answer is no. The answer is no. <laughs> yeah, I think I start making, I, I start making the step up after about three, four. <laughs> okay, so what's your favorite city in the U.S. other than the one you live in? Oh, wow. Misdirection like there. I like Portland. Um, I wouldn't want to live there, um, but 
of the oh well i mean uh, yeah um i'm trying to think of like internationally because i was limiting myself to the united states but um no I, th I still like portland um it's interesting because um i forget how spoiled we are in salt lake city because apparently salt lake city i might have said this before has the largest per capita uh number of vegan and vegetarian restaurants uh in salt lake city uh they compared it to like new york and new york would need to like have 400 more uh vegan sp specific restaurants to be on the same level as salt lake city is now just because of per cap because we have a lot for and whenever we go to other places so this is like a thing that i use to determine like how well we'll get on in various cities nashville sucked uh and seattle was surprisingly difficult to find places but portland is freaking portland because everybody there is already gluten-free and vegan so i mean that was pretty natural and um it's really pretty uh in portland much more so than other and i really like urban places i'm i'm a city boy so uh yeah portland wow this is a tough one this is a really tough one <laughs> tougher, I guess than, I, tougher than the seven dwarfs <laughs> yeah a lot tougher than seven dwarfs because i could google that <laughs> i can't google what my favorite city besides the one i live in is um because there's just so many good options Clearly, I have probably eliminated Virginia. Anything in Virginia. <laughs> like in episode two or three or 10 or 11 or something like that. Um, but outside of that, there's not a lot of cities that I'm, I'm disappointed in. I feel like your, your impression of a city is so much um, influenced by the people that you meet there or are, are going there with or know there or, or whatnot. Um, mm. <laughs> man i can't have such a hard time answering this I, I let's go with saint paul this one would be the stumper <laughs> saint paul saint paul yeah just as it's most recent in my head as, as an interesting city i went to yeah but gosh ask me again in three months and it'll probably be a different answer i'm sure it will be yeah because you visited other new cities yeah, maybe, or maybe my thought process will have changed, or maybe my my memory will have influenced something, or I'll have some nostalgia about a thing that happened, or 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 I'll be thinking about food, or Chicago, or or Detroit, or there's just so many cool places. Why did I buy a house? <laughs> we should sell the house. You can still see cool places and have a house. That's but think about how much people cash me. I would have if I sold the cow house that's, and bought something with wheels. That's literally what uh, one of my coworkers did a couple years ago. Is they sold their house and they used that money from the sell sale of their house to travel across Europe and just nomad it for a year. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and on that note, we're all going to go shift our lives. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so now I have to add googling um, like RVs to my. <laughs> Hashtag van life. Yeah. Our old pal Shannon had that really cool camper, right? Yeah. That thing is fantastic. Homemade. I wonder if I could add a hitch to the minivan. I'm sure it's possible. Myself, obviously. I'm sure it's I mean, possible that DIY, whether it's wise, is for me. Thank you for listening to Binary Jazz. If you like this episode, you can subscribe to us on iTunes or Google Play. You can visit us online at binaryjazz.us or follow us on Twitter at, at @binaryjazz. Don't forget that you can ask us a question through the form on the website or on Twitter, and we'll read it aloud on the next episode of Binary Jazz.